Good morning, everyone. Charlie came to me yesterday and said, I think I want to do something a little different for Halloween tomorrow. I'm like, yeah, that sounds really cool. So, but, but Charlie, that is actually Bach. Is that right? Uh, a toccata by Bach. Toccata in D minor. So, so that is classical music. So that's pretty cool. So, so any youth out there, it, it can be kind of cool. So <laughs> welcome to worship on, on October 31st. It's not often that Halloween falls on a Sunday, but, but welcome um, to those of you here in the sanctuary and those joining us at home. We're glad that you are, are with us. We are hopeful that we will have a safe Halloween um, today, th today, this year. And we also um, I'm, are glad that we actually got some decent weather for a Sunday. So it's amazing how each Sunday is completely different. But we're glad for the trick-or-treaters tonight that, that it is going to be hopefully a nice night. We will start off with a, a good number of announcements, so I will go as quickly as possible. Today we have the, uh, well, all the Sunday, adult Sunday school classes and the youth Sunday school class are back in session following the worship service. At 7 o'clock we have the youth group tonight, and it's kind of a party type thing because of Halloween. There is no 6 o'clock study group tonight, so just the 7 o'clock youth group. And then on, we actually don't have any meetings this week, which is just amazing. And then um, please remember that next Saturday is our next Saturday evening contemporary worship service. We will have communion served at both Saturday night and Sunday um, next weekend. So please come and join us. You'll get communion either service that you come to. And the, the Saturday service runs for about 45 minutes starting at 5.30 p.m. And we are going to have some refreshments after this one. So it may be that you do exactly what your mother told you not to, and you eat dessert first next Saturday. So we would love for you to come and join us um, for, for that Saturday evening service. Our church conference, the annual church conference, will take place on Monday, November 8th. So please remember that that is not tomorrow, but the next week. Um, Staff Parish will meet at 6.30, and then the conference will start here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. Also remember that next week is November 7th, you're going to want to fall back. So you have your, your clocks um, go back an hour. You get an extra hour of sleep next Saturday night before you come to worship. And also next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. And what that means is that we remember those people, who, those loved ones that have gone on to be with God in the last year. Marcia said that today you can still turn in if there's someone that passed away in the last year and you would like to be able to get them remembered next Sunday. Please, please just leave a message for her in the office or send an email. Let's see, uh, a few other things that are coming up. The, there is a new members meeting. Anyone who's interested in becoming possibly a new member of the church, that will be on Tuesday, November 9th at 6.30 p.m., so please consider that. The Red Cross Blood Drive is coming up November 18th, Thursday, November 18th in the afternoon here. We are having a, an ecumenical Thanksgiving Eve service on the night before Thanksgiving that will be held here at our church, and there are three other churches that are joining us. So please consider this. We did this two years ago. We didn't, of course, last year, um, but I think it was uh, maybe three years ago, two years ago, I think. Um, but 7 o'clock here on Thanksgiving Eve. Uh, Karen also wants me to lift up that we are going to be doing our Choral Christmas Cantata on Sunday, December 12th. Anyone who's interested in participating in just the cantata can get a book and a rehearsal CD. You don't even have to come to all the practices, but if you'd like to participate on December 12th, see her and she can, she can hook you up with some, some good music on that. I am in need of some people who might be able to help me serve communion on Sunday mornings. Um, it's the first Sunday of each month, and I would, I would like to have at least one, if not three additional people helping me each one, like JD did, did last month. So there's a sign-up sheet on the uh, counter outside of the office. If you're interested and can do that, please let me know because it really will make um, communion go a little bit faster and easier. Um, Carla from the uh, Hungry World Farm wanted to let, me, let you know that there is a fall work frolic 
next Saturday. I have never heard of work being a frolic, but that's what they're calling it. Join in some invigorating work projects and great fellowship. Projects will range from light to vigorous physical work, including cutting wood, breaking down cardboard boxes, cleaning, clearing brush and small trees. So that is um, next Saturday, November 6th from 9 to 4, come for part or all the day, and a lunch of farm-made soup and bread will be served. Um, so, so that sounds kind of fun. Uh, let's see. Second story, the Teen Center is looking for volunteers, so if you're interested in working with them, downtown Princeton. And lastly for me, the physical newsletters for November, as well as the November-December upper rooms are available on the counter outside of the church office. So lots of stuff going on. We're in that season. And Ben, I believe you had an announcement you wanted to lift up. Pastor, yes. today is the last day of the month for Pastor Appreciation Month. Oh. So on behalf of the <laughs> staff parish and the congregation, we'd like to say thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you. That's very nice. Should I open it? You can. It's a bunch of paper. <laughs> wow. There's a card, which is really nice. And oops, there is something on the bottom here. Hey. My favorite Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Yay! I am very happy. And when I, I'm going home to hopefully spend some time with my, with my um, nephew trick-or-treating tonight, these will be gone by the time I reach Rochelle. So thank you very much. And don't lose that card. Oh, okay. Something I'll send it to. Oh, okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Let's bow our head. Whoops, I can take this off now again. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for our focusing prayer as we begin our worship of God. God above all, we've seen what you do when you set your power at work in our world. Where there is justice for the oppressed, we sense your presence. Where the hungry are fed, we know the providers are working with you. You set prisoners free and open the eyes of the blind. You lift up those who are bowed down and you sustain the righteous with your love. Be with us now as we worship a God who is living, active, and loving. Through Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. And now I'd invite you to stand if you're able as we join Ben in our responsive call to worship. Our call to worship today is adapted from a prayer by St. Patrick. Uh, please join me. We arise today through a mighty strength. God's power to guide us. God's might to uphold us. God's wisdom to teach us. God's eyes to watch over us. God's ear to hear us. God's word to give us speech. God's hand to guard us. God's way to lie before us. God's shield to shelter us. God's host to secure us. Amen. And if you'll please remain standing as you're able as we join in our opening hymn, number 733, the first, second, and fourth verses of Marching to Zion.
may be seated all except for Hannah, if you'd like to come forward for the children's message. And here she comes. And you're right in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Good. You're good? Are you excited because of something that's going on today? Yes. Yeah. And can you tell me what exciting thing is happening today? We're going trick-or-treating. are going trick-or-treating. And what are you going to be for Halloween this year, Hannah? A black cat. A, uh, is that what you are right now, too? Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, did you know, though, that a long time ago, the most important day around this time was not Halloween, but tomorrow? Do you know what an important day tomorrow is? No. Okay. Well, it is November 1st, and that is All Saints Day. That's when we remember that the people who have gone on to be before us and go back to heaven, okay? They remembered their loved ones being with God in heaven. So the day before, which is today, All Hallows' Eve or Halloween, was considered a bit scary because the line between the living and the dead was considered thinnest on this day, and, yeah, there we go. There's, there's Henry, too. Yes, you're right. So the thought was that things scary thin. There's Dad, too. Yep, you're right. Um, so the thought was that things, scary things could happen on this day. So right now, we just like to dress up in sometimes scary costumes, right? Do you ever get scared when you see a real black cat? No? Okay, good. Neither do I. That, those are my favorite kind of cats. So I want to show you something up on the screen, and I want to see if you'd be scared of it in real life. Okay, can you see the screen up there, or you can look over here? Can you see what's going on there? Okay, can you look over here? Look, look over that way. Do you see what's going on over there? What do you think that is? It's dust? No, it's actually not dust. Can you take, a, take another guess as to what that is? It's all out over a field. A dust or a tornado would be a good guess, but actually, no. Those are living things. Do you know what those are? No. Those are birds. Those are a whole bunch of birds. Would that be kind of scary if you saw that? No. No, okay. I don't know. I think I might get a little scared about that. Okay, what do you think is going on there? Why are they flying together? I don't know. You don't know. That's okay. They are trying to find a resting place for the night and to be safe from those that might eat them. Do you know what might eat birds? Black, black cats. They just might. They just might. But there are hundreds of thousands of them. This is a group of starlings. And they're ordinary birds on their own, but not when they get all together. That was kind of scary, wasn't it? No. Okay. Well, they do that because there's safety in numbers. If a hawk tries or a cat tries to get one of those small birds, they're scared away by the sound of, oh, about a half a million birds chirping at the same time. Or a half a million beaks that could pack away at them. That would kind of scare me if there were a half a million birds coming at me, that you wouldn't be scared by that? No. Okay, good for you. But what's really interesting is that you see that group moves all at the same time, all in pretty much the same direction. A group of starlings flies together as one unit, and they can't be divided up. They're all as one, they act as one bird. Do we do that as human beings? Do we all act exactly the same all the time? No, we don't. Do you do everything exactly the way Henry does it? No. No, very good. But sometimes we should. Sometimes the sh church should be like that. We should need to concentrate on doing things together for the good of everybody. So do you think we could work on maybe working together a little bit more as the church and as people? Yes. Very good. Do you, can you think of one thing that we might be able to work together on a little bit better? Yes. Yes. Do you want to tell me what you think that would be? Yes. Okay. Would you like to share that now? Yes. And what is that? Um, if someone is 
his heart will to go to the hospital and people help them. Very good. That is wonderful. That was a perfect answer. So thank you very much. You have a fun time trick-or-treating as a black cat, and don't get caught in a group of starlings, okay? Okay? Yeah. Very good. Now you can head up to Miss Chris. Whoa, and you're bouncing like a kangaroo, too. My goodness. Thank you so much, Hannah. Okay. And we are now, as the chancel choir, going to perform for you. We have a few people out sick today, so, but we think we're a pretty mighty group today anyway. So soon and very soon is the song that we'll be performing today. And how was Charlie on that bass solo? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. So, <laughs> Ben, if you would like to bless us with the reading of the first scripture lesson. Our first 
comes from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those who help in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Thank you. And if you're able, if you'd please stand for the reading of our gospel lesson today. Or, I'm sorry, it's New Testament lesson. This is Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did, you, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, and found her, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, we are back to finish our Challenging Women of the Bible series after a break for the Methodists on the Move Sunday last week. We end our time with the very difficult story of Sapphira. I have to admit, this is a story that I've tended to shy away from in my professional career as a pastor. Usually, people falling down dead due to cheating God is not the uplifting topic people want to hear on Sunday morning. But I have to admit, and this did not originate with me, but it has been joked about in clergy circles that on Stewardship Sunday, we, need, we should urge people to give money to the church, and then we just read this passage aloud, look everyone in the eye, and sit down with nothing else said. It might make an impression, but I really don't think that's what God wants either. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God loves a cheerful giver, not one who's afraid for their life. But that being said, there can be no doubt what causes the downfall of Sapphira and her husband Ananias, the love of money and an unwillingness to give what they should to God's work. To give a little background on this story, we are now in the time of the first Christian church. Jesus has been dead and buried, come back to life, and is now ascended to his father. The disciples are charged with spreading the good news of Jesus' teachings and salvation. And God is blessing their efforts. They now have many believers, and especially in the main Jerusalem area, they've created a type of commune. It seems that these first Christians lived in the same area, ate their meals together, and shared their resources. 
They were so taken with what Jesus had presented them that they gave up everything to help bring it to others. You know it had to be a God thing to have this communal living work out, as it was necessary to the survival of the movement, yet most of the time people don't do this very well, giving up individual lives and living solely for the greater good. People were just as human 2,000 years ago as today, and they would have missed the privileges of being unique and spending what they earn. But according to the Bible, the group that began the church was of one heart and soul, and there was no private ownership of anything. Whatever, whenever money was needed, a house or land would be sold, and the proceeds distributed as needed. In fact, right before the tale of Ananias and Sapphira, there is a brief story about a man nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, who sold a field and laid all the money at the disciples' feet. So it sounds like everything was going along swimmingly in the early church. But as we know, nothing is ever quite perfect, and not even church leaders can know what's going on in everyone's head and heart. It sounds like Ananias and Sapphira were a wealthy couple. They were at least definitely landowners. Before they sold their land, they evidently agreed to give the proceeds to the fledgling church. Nowadays, we would be overjoyed to get, say, half the sale of land. So few people actually give 10% or the tithe of anything. But with land prices these days, imagine what a church could do with that. But that wasn't the problem this couple ran into. It was that they presented it as though they were giving their all. For some reason, they weren't together when the money was presented to Peter, who's the leader of the church. Ananias gives a substantial monetary gift to him, and I imagine expects to be lauded just like Barnabas. Instead, Ananias never speaks another word. Peter chastises him, telling him that the Holy Spirit has made it known that he and his wife have not given everything the land was sold for. He believes Satan caused this to happen, and in reality, it is God who the couple lied to. Pretty strong words. But we have to remember that we really don't know why Ananias died. Peter doesn't ask for him to be struck down. The Bible doesn't say that God threw a lightning bolt to kill him. Now, I think a plausible explanation is that Ananias never thought that he would be found out, and probably being an older man couldn't take the stress and suffered a fatal heart attack. We don't know why he died, but he did, and everyone who witnessed the situation was scared, rightfully so. It would make me think twice about ever trying to pull one over, not only on God, but on his representatives. So others in the group wrap up the body and bury him. A very sad situation indeed, but certainly one that made an impression on the young church and how open and honest people are, were expected to be now and in the future. Three hours later, Sapphira comes waltzing in. Sadly, no one has told her the news about her husband. Granted, this was in a time before cell phones, but it makes you wonder how well-liked this couple was or possibly they really hadn't integrated into the group yet. But no matter what, no one sought her out to tell her that Ananias died, nor does anyone say anything as she comes in to meet Peter. And I have to admit, he does not show the most pastoral care. Instead of comforting her, Peter gives Sapphira a chance to own up to what was done. He says, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. She answers affirmatively. Assuming Peter told her the amount of money that her husband gave him, we know that Sapphira out and out lies to the head of the church. I imagine Peter was just shaking his head. Why in the world would this woman lie to his face? So he says that he knows what she and her husband did, that those who buried her husband are back, and they will now be taking her out as well. Again, I know this seems really harsh. 
a death sentence is handed out for her as well. So Sapphira dies at the feet of Peter and is then buried next to her husband. And the last line of the story is, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. Yes, you can imagine there might be some fear involved since who knows how many others hadn't given everything to the communal pot. What might they be thinking at this time? But I also imagine people within and outside the group had to be thinking, exactly what type of God is this who will strike his followers down if they don't follow him with every single thing they have? That certainly would have gotten my attention. And to be honest, if I wasn't already in that group, I'd have thought twice about getting involved in it. While it would be, while it would be great to get along, get that, let me start over. While it would be great to belong, do I really want to always be worrying about whether I'm going to be struck down for not doing something? Interestingly, there is nothing ever again said about Ananias and Sapphira after their deaths. They are forgotten. The fear is eventually forgotten as well. Maybe the lesson was learned, and the people in the early church didn't try to cheat God again, so it didn't need to be mentioned. But certainly Ananias and Sapphira might have felt their punishment was a bit severe for the crime. After all, they had just given to charity. It wasn't as though they were stealing from it. They were being what we would call today good Christian givers by giving a healthy portion of what they earned to God's work. One nowadays doesn't think of being punished simply because they don't give enough. Now, Sapphira also lied to the head of the church. That was definitely a no-no, even in those early days. But again, very few of us would encourage the death penalty to be given to someone who lies one time. So what is it that we're supposed to learn from this extreme example of not following the Lord's rules. There are a few possibilities that run through my head. The first is that the real crime these two did was not keeping back money, but not recognizing their part in the greater Christian community. Throughout the New Testament, it is said over and over and over again that each of us is given gifts and talents to share for God's use. And that means we are to use them to help others whom God loves. Some may have the gift of teaching, so they should teach. Some have the gift of preaching, so they should preach. But then there's the gift of having money that can be used to help with people's needs or to allow ministry to increase. It just might have been that Ananias and Sapphira sold their land for $10,000 and gave the disciples a hundred dollars of it. If so, it would have been pretty easy for the rest of the church to know they weren't giving their all. If this was the case, then it's certainly true that this couple really didn't feel a true part of the Christian community. They didn't really belong. They allowed themselves to be influenced by the outside, seeing that they could do just a little bit and still be a part of this new organization. Maybe it made them look good in the community. Maybe the church piqued their interest and they wanted to help it out. We really don't know their intentions behind being a part of that church. But we do know they weren't fully invested or else things wouldn't have turned out as they did. Evidently, this husband and wife weren't quite ready to give their all as what the church needed at that early stage. What God needed from those involved at the church at that point was 100% devotion. Ananias and Sapphira weren't able to give that. Another thing we can learn from this couple, and especially Sapphira, is that we always have a choice between listening to the voice of the right and good or the voice of the not so good. Too many people these days, and evidently thousands of years ago as well, tend to put the blame for their actions on either God or Satan. Often when, people's, often when something doesn't work out as it's supposed to, the reason for it is placed on the supernatural. Either the devil made me do it, or 
it must have been God's will. Although I do believe that God and evil vie for influence in each of our lives, I don't believe that either completely controls everything we do. I don't think there's a little angel and a little devil sitting on our shoulders, whispering in our ears like on so many cartoons. But we are certainly influenced each and every day. We can actively decide whether we'll do what God has taught us, what we've heard Sunday after Sunday, what is put on our heart and conscience, or we can choose to take the easy route and follow the way of the world. But neither of those influences have complete control over us. We do have free will. Now in the story we heard this morning, Peter states that Satan had control of Ananias' heart and lied to God's Holy Spirit, causing him to keep some of the money for himself. So in this case, Peter believes that the evil one caused negative things to happen to this man. But he also states that Ananias had the control of what could be done. He chose to keep back some of the proceeds from the land sale. He could have given everything. He decided not to. Evidently, Satan put that thought into his head, but the man was the one who chose to follow through on it. And when it comes to Sapphira, Satan isn't named but implied as the one who caused her to test God's spirit. There are always going to be competing choices for what we listen to in this world. But ultimately, each person makes the choice of which option to follow. While it is wonderful to have the free will to choose, it also means that we can choose wrongly. And God isn't going to just correct us before we make a single mistake. I've shared this before, but it's one of the stories my mom loves to tell about me. But when I was two, three years old, I was fascinated by our electric stove at home. In the 1970s, they had those coils that would turn red. And so I would love to go up. I would see that starting to glow red, and I would be like, oh, this is so cool. And I would reach out for it, and mom would pull me back each and every time. Finally, and I'm still not sure on this, Mom, if you're watching, so you can tell me later today. But she either didn't catch me or she let me touch it. I don't remember. But she definitely heard about it after I experienced that. Let me tell you, I've never touched one of those again in my entire life. I had the free will to do it. I suffered the consequences. Like in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, the wrong choice can have disastrous results. That's the trade-off of not having God control us and making every single choice for us. Sometimes we wish God would make us do exactly as he wants. Then we'd never have to worry about making a mistake. But then we wouldn't have free will. And most certainly we'd complain that life is too boring or that our lives are truly not our own. So I believe God did the right thing in giving us that free will. We can listen to either of the voices, but we also know what will give us the best life. It's just a matter of choosing it. And lastly, we need to end this story on a positive note. Because of the sad subject matter involved, it's difficult to find a silver lining here. But I think we can find one in Peter's question to Sapphira. Her secret had been found out by the disciples. She didn't know that. But rather than accuse right off the bat, Peter gives the woman an opportunity to come clean. In other words, he extends her grace, the chance to admit she had done wrong. But as always, the person gets the choice whether to accept that grace or not. So Peter asked her if the money he has in his hand is what she and her husband sold the land for. Without knowing what had happened to Ananias, she may have wondered where this question was coming from. She might have decided to be truthful before these representatives of God. But no, she continues the deception, stating that what he has is the total price they were paid. Sapphira pays the price for that lie. Now, we can't know if she had a heart attack as well. Maybe she was already frail and this put her over the edge. But the moral is that Sapphira chose greed 
over grace, and she paid for it with her life. More than likely, thankfully, we are not going to fall over dead if we lie against the Lord. But our lives certainly aren't going to be as meaningful if we continually deny God's extension of grace and eternal life. In almost every case I've known, humans are given chance after chance to make a decision for God. But eventually, if greed is chosen over grace too many times, a point of no return may be reached when the person feels God just won't take them anymore. That certainly is not the case. God will always welcome one of his own back home. But oftentimes the choice of setting aside the guilt and shame and then making the necessary changes are just too much. But do know that God will always, always extend that hand of grace. It's a matter of whether the choice will be made to grasp it and in conjunction grasp a better way of living. So with Sapphira's sad end, we come to the end of the Challenging Women of the Bible sermon series. Hopefully we've been able to learn from Delilah, Jezebel, Mrs. Job, and Sapphira, especially in terms of what not to do in living a good life. While we in the church tend to concentrate on Jesus and what to do from his life and teachings, sometimes it's helpful to look at other role models and make sure people know the things that can be harmful to one's practice of the faith. So, from these women, remember not to use your gifts only for yourself, nag too much, take for granted what you've been given, do only what you want to do when you're in a different culture, think that bad deeds won't have consequences, pretend that your integrity doesn't make a difference in life, Think that you don't have a choice between good and bad, and believe that grace shouldn't be chosen over greed. The ladies in these stories all learned the hard way on these subjects. It is my hope that we learn from them and go with what God wants without suffering the hardships they did. And hopefully in the future we will be learning from the challenging men of the Bible as well. So learn from the challenging women of the Bible what not to do, for life will be less difficult and more blessed if you do. Amen. And now I'll invite Beth to come forward as she leads us in our singing of our middle song, which is Keep Making Me. Do you are my breath, my 
Thank you, Beth. We will now share in our joys and concerns for today. We certainly want to lift up um, the family and friends of Roy Pearson, who passed away on Friday, especially Marilyn, who was a very important friend of his. I'll be doing Roy's service at Norberg's on Tuesday of this week at 6 p.m. So please pray for the comfort of the family as they deal with this very difficult time. We also lift up the family and friends of John Olinger, who is the former pastor of the Christian Church here in Princeton. He passed away this last week. And we especially lift up prayers for his wife, Pauline. They were married for 64 years. We also lift up those who had MRIs this week, including Jeannie Guin. We lift up Frank Cabral, who will start chemo and radiation treatments um, very soon. Several people gave thanks for the cards that they received this week from the Methodist on the Move Sunday we had last week. Thanks to everyone who participated, especially Kara and Shelley, for, for organizing it. Um, we had about 25 be able to, to participate, and it was a lot of, lot of fun, and we got a lot of work done, too. We lift up Dorothy Graft. She is doing well in Liberty Village. She's working hard to get home again soon, but she'd also like prayers for her children, Duane and Diane, as they deal with recent health issues. We also lift up the family of Marge Pratt, uh, who is Anna Roadhouse's daughter-in-law's mother. She passed this week after her battle with cancer. And we also lift up Melody Powell, um, who asks for prayers as her lupus is acting up again. And there's just a good number of people who are sick. I think it's pretty much with just colds or flu. Um, but please um, be in prayer for all those who just aren't, aren't feeling well this day as well. If you'll please bow your heads with me for the pastoral prayer, and then we'll say our Lord's Prayer together. Colorful God, the cool weather is moving in, and the colors change from green to red, gold, yellow, and orange. As we gather in all we need for winter, may we stop and marvel at the fruits you bring, the painted landscapes, the bounty of this great land on farm and in store. As our hemisphere prepares for rest and sleep after long days of work and play, may we know a quiet peace of mind that you always gather us together in your warmth. Help us draw in others who might not yet feel this warmth. So we become a people who share your bounty of food and spirit with all we meet. We lift to you this day our collective prayer for those in need. Some need physical healing. Some are dealing with emotional difficulties. Some are dealing with grief. Some are struggling in relationships. All need your healing touch. Provide what is truly needed, Lord, and spur us, your children, to help in the process in the way you provide for us. Hear us and help us, we pray, in the name of the gracious giver of salvation, who taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I did forget just a couple. We continue to need to pray for farmers. Um, there are some who are complete, have completed their, the harvest, but there are plenty who um, have not. And so um, we, with all the rain that we've had this last week, there's a lot of, lot of farming left to be done. So we pray for their, their safety. Um, uh, Kautzes, we just lift you up in prayer. I know that you went up, up north, right, um, this last week. So to, to take care of some, some um, uh, memorial services. So we pray for you. And I have some, some of my former Morrison people here um, today as well. So. I'm grateful that you're here and for any who might be um, driving um, today or this week, either on vacation or just back home, we pray for you. 
And also we say thank you to everyone who gives money to our church. I have to say, normally I would say for keeping the heat on, um, we've been without heat in half of the building for two weeks now. <laughs> so we are getting that fixed on Tuesday of this week. So certain areas are, have not been the warmest, but it also helps you appreciate a warm sanctuary and a warm place to be able to worship God. So we do say thank you to everyone who gives to the ministry of our church. Um, for those who are in the sanctuary, you of course can give any offerings that you have in the plates that are located at the exits of the sanctuary. Um, for those who are worshiping online, please know you can always send in, the, uh, send in your, your offerings, put them in the locked white box outside the main doors or give via PayPal. And as always, it is truly, truly appreciated. If you'll please bow your heads with me for the offering prayer, and then if you're able, please stand as we sing our doxology. Receive from us, O God, the best we have to give. All we have does come from you. So we now return a portion with joy to accomplish the work we do in your name. May our offerings and our lives please you. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn for today, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 556.
before we finish, I do also want to say that I forgot to mention that the Princeton football team won, so congratulations. I know Jenna's, Jenna and Maggie are on the cheer and praise, uh, not praise teams, but they, they do all kinds of cool stuff on that. Um, but Rochelle also won, so both of my teams are, are soldiering on in the, in the, and Kiwani, yes, I'm sorry, but Charlie wanted me to say that Kiwani won too, so. <laughs> Uh, we thank all those who are helped with the service um, today. We've got Bruce and Josh and Maggie in the back working on the technical aspects. Jeannie and Julie help put the PowerPoint together. Charlie, of course, and Beth on the keyboards. Karen and the choir for the rest of the music. And Ben on being liturgist. So thank you, everyone. And it is, we have a very full sanctuary today, and that's pretty darn cool. So wonderful to have you here. Please enjoy Halloween. Um, whether you go trick-or-treating or whether you're handing out candy or maybe sneaking a little bit of it yourself, um, do enjoy it as well. But also remember All Saints Day tomorrow, too. If you'll please join me in our unison benediction, the Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow softly at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of your hands. Go in the peace, love, and joy of our Lord. Amen. Amen.